Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant also in us the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. And unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all-holy good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I'm going to really try to keep to the page today, and I'm going to talk fast, so listen, because I have more pages than I normally do, and I want to get it done in less time than I normally do. <laughs> so this is going to be a sprint, not a marathon, all right? Uh, we're, talk, we're here on Trinity Sunday. Today we pray the prayers, and read the readings, and re-educate ourselves, and reorient ourselves to orthodoxy, to the solemn truth of the Holy Trinity. So here we are today on the, sun, the Sunday, the solemnity of the Holy Trinity at Holy Trinity Anglican Church to talk about and think about the Holy Trinity. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you seriously considered the Trinity? When was the last time you sat and meditated on and thought about the Holy Trinity? I mean, I get it. It's a subtle matter, right? Everybody gets the Trinity. Everybody fully understands the Trinity, right? Everybody can, at any given time, at the drop of a dime, fully and properly express the, the truth of the Holy Trinity to anybody who asks them, right? Well, we all know that that's not exactly true. And we know it, and so maybe now it's time to think about the Trinity. We know that it's not true that we could do that. Gosh, it's hard enough for me to do that at the drop of a dime. Because I like to tell stories and I like to relate things to things and you can't really relate the Trinity to anything. I'll get to that in a minute. But it's time to think about the Trinity. It's time on this day to stop and meditate and consider the Holy Trinity. The, whole, the early church certainly did. It preoccupied the early church. And the reason that it preoccupied the early church is because the Trinity speaks to the very essence of the divine nature itself. Which speaks directly to the divine image that we bear as humans. And the relationship that we as human beings and image bearers share with that divine nature eternally expressed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The early church spent a lot of time thinking about these Things because they understood that really all heresy is about who God is. The two greatest battles that the early church fought, or that the church has ever fought over the course of its history, is over the nature of the triune God and the nature of the union of the human and divine natures of Christ. And these things are related. Deeply, because if the Son is not God, then there's no reason to ask about the divine nature of Jesus as it relates to our human nature. But when it comes to the Trinity, there are a number of fights that the fathers had to have. They had to have the fight against the Arians, who said that Jesus was a created being and not God the Son, eternally begotten of the Father. They had the fight against the Pneumatomachians. New, new, new which literally translates from the Greek as the fighters against the Spirit, those who denied the divinity of the Spirit or who denied the personhood of the Spirit. The three great men we call the Cappadocian Fathers were called the champions of the Trinity. One of them is, my, is, is one I call, I have a patron saint, St. Columba, but I have, people, I have other, other saints that are competing for the role. Uh, and St. Gregory of Nice is one of them. He's one of my great, great guys. Uh, his, great, his, his push on apocatastasis is one of my, is like really inside of me. But, and I've already talked about that, so I'm not going back to that. Uh, 
But Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, and uh, Basil the Great, the Cappadocian Fathers, the champions of the Trinity and of Orthodoxy. And it was the Trinity and Christology that came to define Orthodoxy in the early church. But what about today? I mean, that, I mean, we really live in the Orthodox idea of the, the Trinity. We know it, right? Well, it seems that so many strange and classical heretical ideas about the Trinity still persist in those who dare to try to articulate their belief in the triune nature of God. Around this time of year, every year, every single year on Facebook, the same old articles make the rounds in all the social media universe telling those who preach on Trinity Sunday to please avoid these heresies about the Trinity. Well, I thought today that instead of avoiding them, I would just Trape, trape them all out here and put them on display. What better way to really explain and describe what is exactly wrong with them? You guys are smart. Everybody's smart. I mean, you guys are smart. You can understand what, you know, what I'm saying. I don't want to back off and say we can't enter into this because that, that brings things in the shadows and then you can't really truly understand why that's different than <coughs> orthodoxy. So I want to bring them all out on display and let you all see, see what, why we don't why we shouldn't say these things, why we shouldn't use these analogies, and why these, these beliefs are heretical when it comes to the Trinity. So I'm going to bring them out, and I'm going to put them on display for you this morning. And I also want to uh, let you know why they're not true, and, why, and, and also reassure you that these ideas persist because they've been around since the beginning. We're not, we're not, we don't have to fight the same, we don't have to fight new battles, we're fighting the same ones over and over. They're still wrong, though, but here they are. The first one, modalism. Modalism is the belief that God is one God who shows himself in various different ways, in three different ways at different times. At times, he will display himself as God the Father. At other times, he will display himself as God the Son. And at other times, he will display himself as God the Holy Spirit. But he is never all three things at one time. That is modalism. It describes purely God in purely functional terms. When he's saving on the cross, he's called Jesus. When he's convicting the world of sin, he's called the Holy Spirit. And when he's creating, he's called the Father. The error here is that this is contrary to what we believe, one God who eternally exists in three persons, not modes of functionality. It is not one God with three names, but in one God in three persons. The second heresy that gets traipsed out today by some, not as much as modalism. Modalism is, is really common. But the second one is tritheism. Three gods, the belief that we uh, worship three gods. We're acu- we, we are accused of that. People who have names like Holy Trinity Anglican Church out on the front. We're accused of worshiping three gods by uh, those who follow Islam and, and other uh, extremely mon- monotheistic religions. But we're not tritheists, and tritheism is a heresy. Um, the belief that there are that we worship three gods, all who share a similar nature, but not the exact same nature. And this, the nature of God is either distinguished or divided, which destroys the unity of God. We don't believe in three persons who share in a species called God, but in three persons who share in an identical, united nature, one single divine nature. That is our orthodox belief, not the belief that there, that there are three separate gods who are just similar and then be, became kind of together in a group. That's, that's polytheism. That's a belief in multiple gods, and we don't believe that. The third is subordinationalism, which is a subset of tritheism, because you, you can't have subordinationalism. I know. I'm sorry. You can't have subordinationalism without being a tritheist. All right? If you are a subordinationalist, you are also a tritheist by definition. The subordinationalist position says that there is one God in three persons, but the essence of each person is different. Therefore, that's where we, we get that it's tritheism. And they exist in a hierarchy, hierarchical structure. That's why it's subordinationalism. The Son is subordinate to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is subordinate to the Son. That's why the Orthodox take issue with the filioque, when, when in, the, in the creed where it says, 
Um, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. They believe that that subordinates the Holy Spirit and therefore has a challenge to the orthodoxy of the divinity of the Holy Spirit and the eternal co-equality of the Holy Spirit. Yes, this is a college, this is a college class this morning. But. So, we hear, and, and they point to scriptures like where Christ says, the Father is greater than I. But Jesus isn't speaking from his divinity there, he's speaking from his humanity, and he humbled himself and emptied himself and became human and united himself to our humanity, and in that sense the Father is greater than him, him in, that, in that sense, but not in his divinity, and his divinity is co-equal with the Father in all ways. So there's no such thing as subordinationalism, and, it's, and that is a subset of tritheism, and therefore a heresy. None is greater in essence or in position or in functionality than the other. As a subset of all of these, there's a number of ways, and this is where I wanted to get really want to get to. There's a number of ways that people try to explain the Trinity. A lot of analogies I'm going to kind of put out to you today and explain to you why that's not a good idea. It's not, not a good idea at all. All right. I want to explain to you why they're almost always wrong and why you should almost never resort to an analogous methodology to explain the Trinity. Number one. Here we go. Tell me or nod your head or shake or laugh or whatever if you've ever heard any of these. The Trinity is like a three-in-one shampoo. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> this, can only, this can only point to either modalism or tritheism. It's mod if it's a modalistic uh, way, you are saying that the shampoo performs three different functions, yet is one substance. You can also say, break down the various elements and say that each function and see them separately is a shampoo and a conditioner and a body wash all together in one. Uh, but they are just different functions. Uh, they, they serve different functions. That's modalism. And that's wrong. You can't do that. Number two, the Trinity is like an egg. This is absolutely tritheistic. While the egg is one, it's each of the substances are different. The shell, the albumen, and the yolk. They're different substances. They're not the same substance. They're all rolled up in the same package, but they're different substances. And that's tritheism. And that is a heresy. Heresy! <laughs> Number three. I've used this. I've used this in the past, in my past. Not now. The Trinity is like water. Have you ever heard that one? It exists as vapor and liquid and solid as ice. But they're yet one, just water. It's all just water. But that's modalism. That's modalism. Because we're talking about three different states of the same thing. Not three things that eternally coexist together as one. Ice, steam, and liquid are functions of, of water or uses or purposes of water. Not necessarily the nature of water itself. When you say sometimes it's a liquid, sometimes it's a gas, sometimes a solid, it's, it's the same as saying it's sometimes the Father and sometimes the Spirit and sometimes the Son. That's not true. That is a heresy. Number four, the Trinity. Now this is one that uh, us Celts, us Irish and Scottish people like to throw out every once in a while. The, the Trinity is like a three-leaf clover. This is tritheism, because there's three different leaves, different leaves. Each leaf of the clover is a separate leaf. It does not share in the same nature as the other leaves, but only has a similar nature. In the Trinity, each member shares in the same nature. Number five, the Trinity is like a man, you may have, might have heard this, who is simultaneously a father and a son and a husband. This is what? What is this? What is it? Come on. Modalism. It's modalism. Because we're talking about functions. He is sometimes, anytime it says the Trinity is like this because this is sometimes, scratch it off your list because it's modalism. Because you can never say that sometimes God is Father and sometimes God is Spirit and sometimes God is Son. You cannot say that and be orthodox. Number six. Oh. Stop with this one because I could go on all day. And I've used this one before too. The Holy Trinity is like a person in the sense that the person is 
body, soul, and spirit. This one can either be modalistic or tritheistic in, as an error. And I've used it many times and it's wrong. It cannot be used to illustrate the orthodox definition of the Trinity. It's modalistic in the sense that the spirit and the soul and the body are three functions of one conscious individual person. But it can also be tritheistic when one considers that the spirit is not the same exact nature as the body or as the soul, because Paul talks about the splitting asunder of spirit and soul. They are not the same. The psyche is not the pneuma of man. They're not the same. So what do we do to express our belief in the Trinity? What is, what do we say? What do we say when somebody asks us to explain the Trinity? I can tell you what to say, but more importantly, I can tell you what to do. But first, here's what we say. Anybody comes and asks you, and you commit this to memory. I don't have it committed to memory, but I would love to have it committed to memory. But here's what we say. Somebody comes up and says, explain the Holy Trinity. This is what you say. And the Catholic faith, and make sure you put that part in. And the Catholic faith is this. That we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Ghost uncreated. The Father unlimited, the Son unlimited, and the Holy Ghost unlimited. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there is not three uncreated, nor three infinities, but one uncreated and one infinity. So likewise, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty. And yet they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is the Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost is Lord, and yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers. One Son, not three sons. One Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. So that in all things as aforesaid, the unity and Trinity and the Trinity and unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved, let him thus think of the Trinity. That is taken from the Athanasian Creed. That is the definition of the orthodox view of the Holy Trinity. If anybody asks you to explain the Holy Trinity and you feel compelled to say anything, say that. Or if you can't say it, have, one, have a card in your pocket. You can hand it to them and say, read this at your leisure. It explains everything perfectly. And you can actually get what the essence of what this is saying by getting the, 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 uh, the Trinitarian Triangle where it has God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it says, the God, uh, it says, the Father is not the Son, is not the Holy Ghost, is not the Father, but it's got God in the center. And it said, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God. The single, same, one, essential, unified nature, but three separate persons. You can get that and you can give it to them as a little visual aid. But I would just say the Athanasian Creed, that portion of the Athanasian Creed, because it makes more, I don't know, it's just, that's it. You, you can't really say it any other way. But here's what I believe to be the most important part. And we're drawn down to the end now, so it's okay. What can we do 
to properly express what the Trinity is. It's easy when we understand that the Trinity is a relationship of utterly perfect what? Love. <laughs> Come on, guys. I've been here for three years. <laughs> the Trinity exists as a relationship of utterly perfect love, eternally present within the fellowship of the Trinity. And we are products of that very love. It is a true and full and complete statement to say that we exist because of the love that exists within the Trinity. We came into being from the love and the fellowship of the Trinity. And to show the reality of the Trinity in this world, of the Trinity, of the Holy Trinity in this world, we must show the world the heart of the Trinity. And that heart is love. Don't get bored with me, people, please. I know I'm predictable. <laughs> but I'd rather you get bored with me saying love than to say a million other true words that keep you on the edge of your seat. <laughs> get bored and get bored to tears with me saying love, 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 love. I'd rather that happen. Because there is no truer word that exists than love. It's the truest word there is. So love because the Trinity is love. Love because you exist because the Trinity loves. <laughs> love because the Trinity loves the person that you're speaking to as much as the Trinity loves you. Think about that. God loves me, the Trinity loves me, Jesus loves me, the Holy Spirit loves me, ministers to me all the time, but not, not that person. I can't, because that person does things I don't agree with. That person does, has a lifestyle that I, I'm not in favor of. So the Trinity cannot love that person like that person, like he loves me. Yes, he does. Yes, God loves that person, the Holy Trinity. That person exists because of the Holy Trinity's love just as much as you do and exists in that love just as much as you do. I'm going to keep saying it over and over again until I start, and I'm not just speaking about people in this room, but until I see the world begin to change and go the way of love, until I see Fundamental, fundamentalism when we were having this conversation begin to die and we begin to express the truth of that that we exist in the love of God and the whole world is, is on the way to fullness and completeness because of the love of God love because love will draw others into the heart of this trinity tell the truth about the trinity Tell the truth. That thing I just said, that the Athanasian Creed. Say it, but more importantly, do it. Tell that truth with what you do. And what you do is you walk in the love of the Trinity. Walk in the truth of that love each and every day with every person that you meet. Walk in the love of the Holy Trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.